give your attention to the reading of God's holy word. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Now John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about the Jordan were going out to him, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water. And behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Thus far the reading of God's word. Let us ask God's blessing upon his word. Lord, we thank you for this wonderful passage of Scripture dealing with the baptism of Jesus. And we ask that you would help us to be attentive to your word, that we might hear what it has to say to us. We ask that you would take these words and bring them to life to our hearts and our minds, that our faith in Jesus Christ might be strengthened, that we might be built up in him, and that we might love him and serve him with all of our hearts. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'm continuing my series through the Gospel of Matthew. We looked at Matthew 1 and 2, the first two chapters of Matthew's Gospel dealing with the birth of Jesus. And just to review briefly, in chapter 1 of Matthew's Gospel, Matthew tells us right out of the gate that his Gospel is focused on telling us that Jesus is the Messiah. The long-awaited Messiah that was prophesied in the Old Testament has now been born. In Matthew 1, Jesus uh, is, is born. Uh, Matthew gives us the genealogy of Jesus, showing that he has the right to the Davidic uh, throne, that he is the king of Israel, that he is the king of the kingdom of God. That's going to be a major theme throughout the Gospel of Matthew, as it is in the other Gospels as well. Jesus preaching that the kingdom of God is at hand. Well, Jesus is the king of the kingdom of God, and here he is. He has been born according to his messianic pedigree he is uh, of the line of david but the nature of his kingdom is not what the jews expected and so there's a key verse in matthew chapter one that kind of sets the, st the 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 tone it sets the stage for the whole rest of the gospel and that's in matthew 1 21 when the angel of the lord said to joseph that mary would bear a son and then he says and you shall call his name jesus for he will save his people from their sins. Jesus is sort of the Greek transliteration of the Hebrew name Joshua, which means that Yahweh saves. He, his name will be called Joshua. His name will be called Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. He is the king, to be sure. He is the long-awaited Messiah. But he is a certain kind of king, a king who comes to save his people, not from the oppression of the Romans, 
but from being in a state of spiritual exile because of their sins. He will save his people, not from oppression, not from political tyranny. He will save his people from their sins. Now, in Matthew chapter 2, Matthew shows us that even as a baby, he was hailed as the king of the Jews. Ironically, though, it wasn't by the Jews. It was by these uh, Gentile wise men. Herod and the Jewish leaders were troubled when the wise men came into Jerusalem, asking, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? In fact, Herod was so troubled by the idea that there might be a Davidic king somewhere out there who could take his place and reign over the nation of Israel, that he went to the extent of murdering the baby boys in the town of Bethlehem, two years old and under, in order to get rid of this potential threat. So Herod is rejecting this claim of Jesus to be the Messiah, and the people, the nation, is also not terribly interested in hearing about it. This is a foreshadow, of course, of the end of the gospel when the people as a whole, the nation as a whole, reject Jesus as the Messiah and have him crucified. Now, another key thing that happens in Matthew 1 and 2 is these fulfillment quotations. Remember where Matthew will say, so and so happened in order to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord uh, through the prophet Jeremiah or through the prophet Isaiah and so on. And Matthew is doing this to show us that all of these details of the birth of Jesus are the fulfillment of redemptive history, to show us that Jesus himself is the fulfillment of God's redemptive plan. Jesus is the culmination of redemptive history. He's the fulfillment of everything that went before. So in the first two chapters, then, Matthew is telling us that Jesus really is the Messiah in fulfillment of Scripture, and that as the Messiah, as God's anointed king, he is coming with this singular purpose, which is to save his people from their sins. And so that brings us then to our text tonight, Matthew chapter 3. Now, around 30 years have transpired since the end of chapter 2. When we last saw Jesus, he was a baby, probably no more than two years old, living with his family in Nazareth. And so we have to imagine in the interval that he had his growing up, he had his boyhood, his teenage years, he was a young man. Uh, probably spent some time uh, growing up and becoming a man. We know that he worked with his father, Joseph, uh, in the carpentry business. Now we fast forward to the key moment when he is publicly presented to Israel. And this is his baptism. The moment when he's baptized by John and anointed by the Holy Spirit as God's Messiah. The coming down of the Holy Spirit upon him is like a symbol of the anointing of the kings of Israel in the Old Testament. But before we get to the baptism of Jesus, Matthew sets the stage for the baptism of Jesus by telling us a little bit about John the Baptist, about his ministry, because John is the forerunner of Jesus. And so I have two points for my sermon tonight. The first point is a very unimaginative, the exposition of the text, and that'll be the two main paragraphs, verses 1 through 12, the ministry of John, and then the second paragraph, the baptism of Jesus in verses 13 to 17. And then the second main point is the meaning of the text, where I have three takeaways that I want to draw from this passage. So the exposition of the text. We begin with the ministry of John. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The reference to the wilderness of Judea is important. And you have to sort of picture it in your mind's eye. Picture um, a desert with low hills and small scrub plants, not all that different from Southern California. Uh, there may have been a little bit more vegetation right around the Jordan River, because it was obviously more well watered. But by and large, it's a desert area. Why is it important for Matthew to mention this? Why does he mention that John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness? Well, because as he's going to say in the next verse, verse 3, this was he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. This is a quotation from Isaiah chapter 40. And if you go back and look at the original context of Isaiah 40, you'll see that Isaiah is 
has already prophesied that Israel will go into exile because of her disobedience and breaking of the covenant. But Isaiah looks beyond the exile to a time when Israel will be restored. And this is what Isaiah now is speaking of in chapter 40. The opening words of chapter 40 are, Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. God told Isaiah to preach the good news to Israel that her warfare is ended. That is, her time of, of trial and struggle, her exile is about to end and that her iniquity is pardoned. God tells Isaiah to preach the good news to Israel that God is about to do something new. He's going to come and restore the kingdom. It will be like a new exodus. In the original exodus, God led his people through the path between the waters of the sea into the wilderness. Israel was there made into God's people at Mount Sinai. And so God is going to accomplish something like that, but new. He's going to do a new exodus, leading his people on a new highway in the wilderness in order to make the people of God as the new Israel. We keep reading in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, A voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. God is doing something unexpected. He's doing something massive. He's doing something on a huge scale. Valleys will be lifted up. Mountains made low. What does all this refer to? Well, the valleys being lifted up refers to all the people who were humble and lowly, like a valley. They're, they're going to be lifted up. And the mountains and the hills, that is those who are haughty and proud and think that they're doing great, they will be brought low. This is exactly what Jesus does in his ministry. Right? He brings down the high and the lofty ones, the scribes and the Pharisees. They think that they have their, all, their lives all figured out. They think that they're so righteous and so scrupulous in keeping every detail of the law. Jesus brings them down. But those who are humble, those who are considered the outcasts, those who are the tax collectors and the sinners and excluded from God's people, he brings them into the kingdom and he lifts up those valleys. So it's pointing here to this major upheaval and transformation of the people of God. Something unexpected is about to happen. Ultimately, we could even say, we could even look beyond the ministry of Jesus to after his ministry, to the time when the Jews as a nation, like there were individuals within the Jewish people that did believe in Jesus, but when the Jews as a nation rejected Jesus, and as a result, they were judged by, by God, and the, the temple was destroyed in AD 70. But on the other hand, the Gentiles, who seem to be outsiders, they're the ones that are brought in, their flock into the kingdom of God. Now, John's ministry marks the beginning of the fulfillment of this prophecy of Isaiah. John is saying, in spite of Israel's sin and exile, the kingdom of God is about to come. This major upheaval is about to happen. God is going to do a new work. He's going to accomplish a new exodus, and he's going to re-establish his people and establish his kingdom. Now notice in verse 4, it says, Now John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Who does that remind you of? That just description of his clothing, the way he's taking, uh, providing for his food, reminds us of the prophet Elijah in the Old Testament. He too lived out in the desert, he too was scrounging for food that he could find. He too walked around in a garment of animal hair and with a leather belt. We're told that in 2 Kings 1, verse 8. Elijah was one of the earliest prophets of the Old Testament. John the Baptist, on the other hand, is one of the last. Well, he is the last prophet of the Old Covenant. Just as Elijah pronounced judgment upon Israel for her idolatry, so also John is warning of the coming day of the Lord which will be a day of wrath and judgment. And just as Elijah, I don't know if you remember this, but just as Elijah split the waters of the River Jordan to create or to recreate, as it were, the Exodus, so also John the Baptist is baptizing at the River Jordan to herald the fact that a new Exodus is happening. 
Just as Elijah was a prophet who anointed kings, so John will baptize Jesus and present him to Israel as her Messiah, as God's anointed king. What's the significance of John taking on the persona of Elijah? Well, it goes back to a prophecy at the end of the Old Testament in Malachi chapter 4, verse 5. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And so by dressing up as Elijah and taking on his persona and acting like him, John is signaling that the long-awaited time has come. This prophecy in Micah 4 is, uh, Malachi 4 is about to be fulfilled. In fact, later on in the Gospel of Matthew, in Matthew chapter 11, after John was thrown into prison, Jesus said that John was the Elijah that was to come, Matthew eleven fourteen. John the Baptist then is the forerunner who announces that everything that the prophets such as Isaiah in Isaiah 40 and Malachi had prophesied is about to happen. Now at this point, I want to zero in on the message of John the Baptist. What was he preaching? What was he proclaiming? Well, let's look at all the verses that have um, quotations of, of his speech. Verse 2, he's saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's really the essence of his message. You could just boil down everything that he's preaching to that one word, repent. His message is a call to the people of Israel to repent in order to get ready for the day of God, for the coming of the kingdom. Um, another quotation of, of uh, John's words is from verse 3, quoting from Isaiah 40, verse 3, prepare the way of the Lord. That's the same idea as repenting. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. Straighten out all the crooked things in your life. Get ready, for God is coming. Uh, look at verse 7. One of the things he says there in verse 7 is, to flee from the wrath to come. The kingdom is coming. God is coming. The day of the Lord is at hand, and it's going to be a, a day of wrath and judgment. So get ready and repent now so that you can flee from that wrath. In verses 8 through 10, when the scribes and the Pharisees come to be baptized, uh, John rebukes them. And so this gives us an, ex an idea of what the content of his preaching was. He calls them to bring forth the good fruit that God is looking for in his people. And he's saying, you guys don't have it. You're just coming and doing this ceremony and pretending that you're repentant, but you're not. You don't really have that good fruit that God is looking for. And then in verse 12, he mentions this analogy of the, the Messiah has his winnowing fork in his hand. And it's not talking about a little tiny dinner table fork. It's talking about one of those big ones that you use when you're, after you've gathered in the harvest of the wheat and you've dried it out, you got to separate the wheat from the chaff, the, the good grain that you can use to make the dough from the chaff that is the husk and all the other parts that are unedible. Those parts are light. And so what you do is you take this big winnowing fork and you lift everything up in the air and the wind will blow the light stuff out. And then the heavy grain will fall back to the floor, to the winnowing floor. So that's what John is saying is that the Messiah is coming with his winnowing fork and he's separating the wheat from the chaff. He's separating the good from the bad. Be the good wheat, John is saying. Bring forth that good fruit. Repent. Get your life in order. Be the good wheat that the Messiah will gather into his barn. Don't be part of the chaff that's going to be separated out, and then he's going to take a big bundle of chaff and burn it up in the fires of judgment. Now, interestingly, I mentioned Malachi 4. This is also from Malachi 4, the message of John. John got this message of telling people to get ready for the day of the Lord because it's coming as a day of judgment. Uh, he got it from Malachi 4, verse 1. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and all the evildoers will be stubble. Stubble is another word for that, that chaff, that light stuff that gets burned up. All the evildoers will be stubble. The day that is coming shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. This is where John got the image of the Messiah throwing the fruitless trees, the trees that don't have any fruit, they're just chaff, throwing them into the fire and burning them up with unquenchable fire. So what's John's message? Well, it's a very simple message. It's not complicated. Anyone can understand it. God is coming. God is about to reconstitute his people as a righteous and obedient nation. 
He's going to do so by getting rid of all the hypocrites, all the people that claim to be part of the covenant people of God but are not, who don't have fruit, who are just stubble and chaff and hay. He's going to get rid of all them. He's going to sift through the covenant people. And he's going to separate out the wicked from the righteous, those who have no spiritual fruit, those who have no obedience, those who have no repentance. And he's going to gather them up and destroy them leaving only the pure, righteous, obedient remnant. And so John is saying, get ready for that. Repent. Don't be one of the wicked. Be one of the righteous who will be spared when the day of judgment comes. But there's a problem. It's a great message, but no one in Israel is able to stand. To, and no one in, in Israel is able to say that they are truly repentant and that they have this fruit. No one in Israel is found who is sufficiently righteous and obedient. Generations have gone by. Remember, after the exile, they, they lived in Babylon. Many of them even stayed in Babylon. There was a remnant that came from Babylon and went back to the land of Judah and rebuilt the temple. But generations have gone by, and the people of Israel are still disobedient to the Lord. They're still rebelling against God and failing to be obedient. Now, maybe they haven't quite return to their old ways of worshiping pagan idols, but they're still disobedient. Their hearts are still hard. In the end, Israel's hardness of heart is so bad that God had to uh, destroy them. He destroyed them in 586 when he destroyed the city of Jerusalem and burned it with fire and destroyed the temple. And the king and his royal court and many of the people were taken into captivity. Why would Israel be able to repent now? There are some people who think that they're repentant, like the Pharisees and the Sadducees coming to get baptized by John. They think that they're the righteous remnant, and yet John shows them that they are not, and that he sees right through them. He even calls them a brood of vipers. The problem is that God has promised to reconstitute Israel, but Israel cannot be reconstituted. God has promised to bring about a new exodus that will redeem Israel from captivity and restore them, but Israel's sin is too deep. She cannot turn back. And repent. Even those who seem to be outwardly keeping the law, like the Pharisees, are actually a brood of vipers because their hearts are not right with God. As Jesus will say later in Matthew 15, this people honors me with their lips, all the right words, but their heart is far from me. And so it's at this point that Jesus shows up on the scene. Now we turn to verses 13 to 17, the baptism of Jesus. Verse 13, then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. Then Jesus came. That's the key right there. That's the dramatic entrance. The people have been coming to be baptized by John, but none of them were sufficiently righteous. None of them stand up to the scrutiny of God's law. None are sufficiently repentant. None are sufficiently obedient. But then Jesus arrived. He is the one Israelite who is truly obedient. He is the one. He, he is the one who will reconstitute the nation in his own person. He is the core of the true Israel of God. He is the one faithful Israelite. And all those who are united to him by faith, like branches grafted into the vine, will become the true Israel of God. But remember, John had been proclaiming that the Messiah was about to come, and that when he comes, he's going to come in judgment. His winnowing fork is in his hand. He's going to clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn. And the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So here is the Messiah. He has come on the scene, but where's the winnowing fork? Where's the judgment? Instead of coming to winnow and to judge, he comes to be baptized by John. And so John is just confused. He's scratching his head trying to figure it out. He even tries to prevent Jesus and says, I need to be baptized by you. Why are you seeking to be baptized by me? Remember, John himself even recognized, uh, going back to verse 11 in his preaching, he said, look, I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me is coming one who is mightier than I. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And so you can see why John would be thinking that He's the one that should be baptized by Jesus so that he could get the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Why should Jesus, who has a mightier baptism, 
be baptized by John, who only baptizes with water for repentance? Well, let's look at Jesus' reply to John's puzzle. In verse 15, Jesus says, Let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. And here we have the solution to our dilemma. Jesus must submit to John's baptism, which is a baptism for sinners, a baptism in which sinners come and confess their sins and repent in order to get ready for the coming day of judgment. Jesus must submit to this baptism of John, not because he has sins of his own to confess, but because he is identifying with the sinful nation in her state of sin, a nation that cannot repent, a nation that cannot obey, a nation that cannot keep God's law, he identifies with the sinful nation in order to submit to the winnowing fork of judgment himself. He doesn't come to dispense the judgment. He comes to receive the judgment. Yes, it is true that one day at the end of history, Jesus will come back, and then he will gather his wheat, his own redeemed people, into the barn, and he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. But before that day, Jesus must first place himself in the position of the people in their sin under the wrath of God. Jesus is the one obedient Israelite. He is the only one who is found to be without sin. He is the only one who is perfectly righteous. But rather than judging the rest of the nation and consigning them to the fires of judgment, he does something amazing. He identifies with his people in their bondage to sin, in their state of spiritual exile. This is what it, what it means when he says that he has come to fulfill all righteousness. And by the way, I think that that's an allusion to a wonderful verse in the book of Daniel. If you recall, in Daniel chapter 9, when uh, Daniel has that, uh, he receives that word from the angel about the 70 weeks pertaining to the fulfillment of all of redemptive history. In Daniel chapter 9, verse 24, the angel says, Seventy weeks are decreed about your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to put an end to sin, and to atone for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal both vision and prophet, and to anoint the most holy place, or it could be the most holy one, probably referring to Christ himself. But that language there, bringing in the everlasting righteousness, that is what Jesus is referring to here. He's saying Daniel 9.24 is now being fulfilled. As he is embarking upon this journey, this path that will lead him to the cross, he is fulfilling all journey, all righteousness. There are two things that he must fulfill. He must fulfill the, the curse of the broken covenant of works, the curse of the law, and he must also fulfill the positive obedience required by the covenant of works the positive righteousness. Since he is going to do what Israel failed to do and what all the kings of Judah and Israel failed to do, he must not only be obedient where they were disobedient, he must also endure the penalty, the curse of the law that they had brought upon themselves leading to the exile. He must take their sin upon himself. He is the Lamb of God who bears away the sin of the world. He must take their place under the winnowing fork of judgment. He is the one who will be burned with the unquenchable fire of the wrath of God on the cross. The baptism of Jesus is simply the first step on the way to the cross. He's committing himself to a life of obedience to God, a life of obedience that will culminate in the final act of obedience when he lays down his life upon the cross for his people. And then, having accomplished all righteousness, having accomplished the atonement, by his obedience to the point of death, he will then be raised from the dead, and he will receive that which John spoke of about this Holy Spirit that he will give. He will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, which he will then bestow upon his people on the day of Pentecost in order to reconstitute the people of God, composed of Jews and Gentiles who believe in Jesus as the Messiah. I think that's interesting, by the way. Just a little footnote here. But... John the Baptist was speaking of the day of Pentecost. I don't think he knew all the timing and how it all worked out. He probably didn't even fully understand about the cross needing to happen first. But he had this idea that this is the Messiah and that he is the one who will baptize his people with the Holy Spirit. 
referring to that future day when having accomplished all righteousness, having been ascended and exalted to the right hand of God, he would receive the gift of the Holy Spirit and pour it out upon his church to make his people anew. So there's so much dense theology in this chapter here in Matthew chapter 3. But I want now to draw out some things that we can take away from the text. The meaning of the text. So there's three takeaways for you tonight. So the first one is really important, and that is this. The ministry of John cannot be taken out of context. It has to be understood as preparatory. It's a preparatory ministry specifically preparing for the Messiah. John baptized the Jews with a baptism of repentance so that they would get ready for the coming of the day of judgment. He called people to repent of their sins and to get right with God so that they could be delivered from the coming wrath. And it's easy, it would be a mistake, but it's easy to just take that message of John, just look at the first section there, Matthew 3, 1 through 12, just take that out of context and say this is the entire message of the gospel. But that wouldn't be correct because John's ministry and preaching was not an end in itself. John was not preaching a message that could simply stand on its own two feet. It was a preparatory ministry, a preparatory message that was only supposed to exist for that brief period of time leading up to the public presentation of Jesus to Israel. The whole reason for John's ministry was to set the stage for the manifestation of Jesus and his baptism. Don't confuse the message of John with the gospel because it's not the gospel. Uh, sometimes Christians get confused about this. They confuse the message of John with the gospel as if that is the whole gospel message is just repent and get ready. Uh, when I was a student at UCLA, I attended a campus Bible study that was a ministry of a large church that I will not mention. And the leadership there taught that this passage here, Matthew 3, 1 through 12, this is the gospel. This is it. The gospel is God's coming to judge the world. When he comes, he's going to save his friends and judge his enemies. So you better get ready to be his friend. And how do you become God's friend? You repent of your sins and start being obedient. <laughs> and the more obedient you are, then you're God's friend. And if you're not obedient, then you will be God's enemy. And when he comes, you're going to be destroyed. That's the gospel. The gospel is stop sinning, basically. The gospel is stop sinning. And uh, it, it pains me to say this, but some of the leaders of this group, they even taught, and I don't think that necessarily the mother church agreed with all of these statements, but the, the people who are leading this particular Bible study on, on the campus of UCLA even taught that if you teach people that the gospel is that Jesus died for your sins so that you could be forgiven, that's not the gospel, that that's a man-centered gospel. It's shocking, but that's what, they, that's what they said. The message that the UCLA Bible study leaders preached was basically this message here, the message of John the Baptist. But even John knew, even John knew that his message was only preparatory, that it was not the gospel. He knew that he was preaching repentance in order to prepare for, what did he say? One who is coming, who is mightier than I. He is the one who will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. The UCLA leadership taught a gospel that had no room for Jesus and the atonement. It had no room for the cross. It had no room for salvation by faith in Christ alone. It had no room for the forgiveness of sins. It was simply a message of repent in order to escape the wrath of God. But the only way we can escape the coming wrath is through faith in Jesus the Messiah, the wrath bearer, who will go down into the waters of judgment for us as our representative, as our substitute, who identifies with us in our sin, and then who leads us out of the exile into the kingdom of God. So that's the first takeaway, is that the message of John the Baptist cannot be isolated from the context of the whole gospel. And to do so is to really distort the gospel and lead to a false gospel. The second thing I want to give you as a takeaway is that the baptism of Jesus is very uh, important because it orients how we interpret the entire message of the four Gospels. 
The four Gospels all have the same basic structure. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They all have the, ba the same basic outline. Um, they begin, well, Matthew and Luke begin with the nativity, but uh, they all begin with the baptism of Jesus. After the nativity, you have the baptism of Jesus. Mark doesn't have the nativity. He just goes right to the baptism of Jesus, right at the beginning, Mark chapter 1. They all begin with the baptism of Jesus, and then they all end with the death and resurrection of Jesus, the passion narrative, right? The whole passion narrative with the extended part about how he was betrayed and arrested and the trial before the high priest, the crucifixion of Jesus, the death of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus. So that's the beginning and the end of all four Gospels. These are the two fixed points of the Gospels. And everything that Jesus does, everything that he says in between those two points has to be interpreted in light of those two points. Think of it like um, two pillars or maybe like two, two metal poles and then like there's a clothesline stretched across these two poles. The first is the baptism, the second is the, the passion narrative, the death and resurrection of Jesus. And then everything that happens in between, every instance of Jesus healing somebody or casting out a demon or all of his teachings, um, all those things are like items of clothing that are attached to the clothesline in between those two points. So everything has to be interpreted in light of the beginning and the end. Um, pretty soon we, we're going to be getting into some interesting parts of the Gospel of Matthew. If you turn over to Matthew chapter 5, uh, you have the Sermon on the Mount. And we're going to be hearing Jesus say some pretty amazing things like, be perfect, even as your Heavenly Father is perfect. Or he's going to say things like, your righteousness must exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. And it's easy to take those things out of context and not interpret them correctly. Um, but if you remember this image of the clothesline, the baptism at the beginning, the cross at the end, and all of these teachings of Jesus are part of that story, then it gives us a context that helps us to understand what Jesus is teaching. He's not preaching works righteousness. He's not going back to simply the message of John the Baptist of saying, stop sinning and get ready for the kingdom. He is preaching a call to evangelical obedience. That is an obedience that flows out of gratitude in response to his grace, not a law keeping that you do in order to somehow earn favor with God so that you are worthy to enter into heaven and escape from judgment. It's a life that we live because we've been, we've been saved, we've been redeemed, we've been granted free forgiveness and free entrance into the kingdom of God. And so now, as those who are citizens of this wonderful kingdom, we live a life that is joyfully and gratefully and lovingly seeking to obey the Lord and to live for him. Because we've already received the blessings of salvation, righteousness, and forgiveness through the Messiah. So the second takeaway from this is you've got to read the Gospels, and Matthew in particular, in light of the baptism of Jesus, which is a foreshadowing of the end of the story. His going down into the waters and then coming back up out of the water and receiving the Holy Spirit is a foreshadow of his death and resurrection and receiving the gift of the Spirit at Pentecost. And so everything that happens after this has to be interpreted in light of this. The third takeaway is this, and it's very simple, but it's just looking at the narrative as a whole. The baptism of Jesus places all the spotlight on Jesus. Notice how the narrative ends there. Matthew 3, verses 16 and 17. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold... A voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. It's like a spotlight beaming down out of heaven upon Jesus, right? And there are other characters on the stage at this moment. There's John the Baptist somewhere over here on the side, and there's some scribes and Pharisees over here walking away, kind of with their heads, their tail between their legs, because John just called them vipers. And there's other people there, but right here in terms of the narrative, the spotlight's on Jesus and everybody else has been kind of put in the shadows and we don't really see them anymore. The spotlight is on Jesus, not on us. 
the voice from heaven is God himself telling us to look at his beloved son because he is the one with whom God is well pleased. And God is totally pleased with him. God is perfectly pleased with him. You can't say that of yourself. No matter how much you may be seeing God working in your life and helping you to grow in sanctification, you cannot say these words that I am God's beloved son with whom he is perfectly well pleased. You cannot say that. You can only say that of Christ. And so the spotlight is shining down upon, shining down out of heaven upon him. And all our eyes, the eyes of the audience is fixed upon him. Don't look at yourself. Don't look at your own righteousness, your own obedience, your own sanctification, such as it may be. Hopefully the Lord is working in your life and helping you to grow, to more and more die into sin and live unto righteousness day by day, to take up your cross and follow him. I trust that if you are truly united to Christ, he is doing that in your life. But don't look at that. Don't rest upon that. Your salvation does not depend upon your repentance. We repent and then we sin again, right? Don't look at that. Look at Christ. Look at what he has done. Look at his perfect righteousness. And remember that you don't have to feel guilty to do that. Like the UCLA leader said, oh, that's man-centered to only talk about the good news of the gospel and how Jesus died for our sins. That's a man-centered thing because of course people want to hear that. They don't want to hear about repentance, but they want to hear about forgiveness, right? Don't, don't think that's a guilty thing to look to Jesus because the Father himself is doing it. The Father himself is looking at Jesus. The Father himself is looking at him and saying, this is my beloved son. I'm happy with him. I'm pleased with him. And so he is pleased with us too, only to the extent that we are in him, only because we are in him. And so don't take it as a man-centered, selfish thing that you are looking to Christ and rejoicing in him and hiding yourself in him and thankful for his righteousness and thankful for his cross by which all your sins can be forgiven because the Father himself is encouraging you to do that. The Father himself is putting the spotlight there and saying, yes, yes, look at him, look at him. He's the one. Hang on to him. Trust in him. What a wonderful Savior we have and how wonderful it is to think that John the Baptist had this unique ministry in redemptive history to be the last prophet of the Old Covenant to kind of segue into the New Covenant and to say, here he is, here he is, here is Jesus. Trust in him, look to him. Let us pray. Father, how we thank you for giving us your son, your beloved son. Thank you that you are well pleased with him. Thank you that he has fully obeyed in our place. Thank you that he has fulfilled all righteousness for us. Cause us, Lord, to be filled with gratitude so that we too may seek to live for him, to repent of our sins, and to endeavor after new obedience in union with him. Take away our heart of stone and give us a heart of flesh to love you, to hunger and thirst after righteousness. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.